we gotta talk about Miles Morales. In 2011, the comic book landscape changed forever when Marvel introduced Miles Morales, a half-black, half-Hispanic Spider-Man for a new generation of fans. And though he was met with quite the mixed reception, the new web slinger would go on to become a pop culture icon and change the way creators and fans alike would view new characters forever. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into the story of Miles Morales, his rise to fame, and his secret superpower that has allowed him to soar to such heights. In order to understand Miles' unique journey, we gotta first understand his origins. In the year 2000, Marvel Comics dropped the Ultimate Universe, which was a huge deal. Considering how DC would constantly reboot their comics every decade or so to keep things fresh, Marvel had gone the last 60 years running one singular continuity that was just downright confusing and extremely difficult for new fans to jump into. However, with 20th Century Fox releasing an X-Men movie and Columbia TriStar releasing the first Spider-Man film soon, this was a perfect time for a new line of comics that anyone, new or old, could sink their teeth into and ride the hype train of superhero movies that was on the horizon. In comes the Ultimate Universe. Now the Ultimate line of comics is more or less what the MCU was birthed from. Instead of giant galaxy ending events and supremely overpowered characters, the Ultimate Universe was to be a more stripped down version of these stories that fans knew and loved. The idea behind this line of comics was, what if superheroes actually existed in the real world? Fast forward 20 years later, and the creation of the Ultimate Universe is probably the single most important reason the MCU did far better than the DC Cinematic Universe. While DC continued to try to place overpowered superheroes in our ordinary world, Marvel's writers and directors already had reference on what their nerf superheroes will look like. What if instead of Tony Stark being smarter than literal gods, he was just a really intelligent dude who made suits of armor? What if the Super Soldier Serum was the equivalent to the real life space race? What if Nick Fury looked like Sam Jackson? The Ultimate Universe took what was made popular by Earth 616 and retold those stories from a slightly more realistic perspective and was a big reason many kids in the early 2000s, myself included, got into comics and became the nerds hyping up the MCU when Iron Man dropped. From the Ultimates to the X-Men and Fantastic Four, these gritty new stories were a hit when the universe first came out but none were more of a hit than the very first series to drop in Earth 1610, Ultimate Spider-Man. While Spider-Man had always been a fan favorite, because of the clone saga in the 90s coupled with the fact that Peter was no longer a teenager, fans had started to sour on the Spider-Man mythos a bit. The question Ultimate Spider-Man aimed to answer was, what if Peter never made it out of high school? Turns out this is exactly what the character needed as fans had always loved seeing this everyday high school kid struggle with things like identity, school crushes, and family dynamics, all while being a selfless superhero part time. And over the course of 133 issues, we got to see an in-depth look at how Peter's life would play out in modern times with the rise of technology in the new millennium. On a personal note, the Ultimate Universe, and specifically Ultimate Spider-Man, was really my first true introduction to comics as the series was at its peak through my middle school years and ended shortly after I graduated high school. It seemed like for every stage of my life at the time, there was an Ultimate Spider-Man arc that I could read where Peter was dealing with some of the similar things and questions about life that I was dealing with. I even believed at the time that the Ultimate Universe was the main line of Marvel Comics. So how does this all relate to Miles? Well, like I said earlier, Ultimate Spider-Man answered the question, what if Peter never made it out of high school? In August of 2011, it was announced that a half-black, half-Hispanic kid would be taking over the Spider-Man mask, and this news came with plenty of haters. And I'm not gonna lie, I was one of those haters. The reason being is just two months earlier, Marvel had done the unthinkable. They killed Spider-Man. In Ultimate Spider-Man number 160, Peter has to face off against the Sinister Six while already suffering from a fresh gunshot wound. He dispatches the first five and proceeds to take on the Green Goblin. This fight occurs in his own neighborhood on his front lawn in front of his family and friends. He has to give everything he can in this final stand in order to save the ones he loves. And after defeating the Goblin, he falls to the ground, exhausted and bleeding out. He confesses to Aunt May that he wasn't able to save Uncle Ben but at least he was able to save her. 
and the next moment he was gone this moment hit in a lot of ways especially for me growing up peter parker was my favorite character in anything his personality always felt very similar to mine and the idea of him being a nerd with athletic capabilities was the epitome of my middle and high school identity and again at the time i genuinely believed that ultimate spider-man was the spider-man so to find out that he had to die to bring in this new kid was far from ideal for me. I didn't care that Miles looked like me. Why did Peter have to die for him to be introduced? Couldn't two Spider-Men coexist? Needless to say, I was not feeling a change and I wasn't willing to give him a chance. Years went by before I even considered picking up a comic book with Miles on the cover. But then finally, after holding a grudge for so long, I sat down to read Brian Michael Bendis' Ultimate Comics Spider-Man issue number one. And boy, did it change everything. The issue opens up 11 months prior to Oscorp. Norman Osborn is looking over a spider specimen, specifically spider number 42. So if you didn't know, in the Ultimate Universe, Captain America wasn't the first super soldier. It was Nick Fury. And the success of the super soldier serum on Nick Fury led to a worldwide scientific race of trying to recreate this formula. Norman Osborn came incredibly close and was using spiders in his experiments. One of these spiders got loose and bit Peter Parker, giving him his power. As you can imagine, the same thing is about to happen to Miles. But as you'll see, spider number 42 has quite a few different characteristics than the one that bit Peter. We then see a thief named the Prowler infiltrate Oscorp to steal something, and spider number 42 hitches a rod on his bag. Obviously, this will become important later. Next, we get our first true introduction to Miles Morales as we see him participating in a charter school lottery. One of the things that made the Ultimate Universe so popular is that writers like Bendis were careful to make sure that the universe stayed in touch with our reality at the time. For those of you unfamiliar with the American school system, allow me to explain what this lottery is. In America, the education system is extremely uneven in terms of quality across the board. There are public schools, which are government regulated and free for anyone to attend. However, students must attend schools within their district and the district that you live in highly determines how much funding your school gets and in turn how quality the education is that you receive. If you'd rather have more control over your child's education, there are private schools, which are privately owned, have smaller class sizes, and can have more focused education options that can lead to specific career paths. However, these schools come at a cost, with tuition ranging anywhere from $300 a month to thousands. And as you guessed it, the more you're willing to pay, the higher quality education your child can receive. But then, in 1992, charter schools began popping up around the country, which essentially allowed your child to attend a free public school in a better district if you were willing to make the commute. In the 2000s, these charter schools became incredibly popular, so much so that they started holding lotteries to pick a few kids out of thousands who would be privileged enough to attend these schools. I personally never experienced one of these lotteries because my parents sacrificed much of their income to put me and my siblings through private school. But I saw my friends go through this. Hearing them talk about the anxiety of waiting for their future to be determined by chance, and even hearing the guilt that some of them felt when they were picked over other kids. Placing Miles in this situation immediately made him relatable to a lot of kids and educated some people on the realities of school in our country. As you can imagine, our boy Miles is picked. And his lottery ball number? Surprise, surprise, it's 42. Now we have to talk about why this number is significant. Growing up black in America, there are three figures in African American history that regardless of education level, you will know about. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Jackie Robinson. Jackie was the first ever African American to play in the, at the time, all white major league baseball. This was absolutely huge as he not only paved the way for other people of color in sports and entertainment, but he was also widely considered the best in the sport. And he did it all while sporting the number 42. As you'll come to see, the story of Miles is one of great expectations and taking over the mantle set before you. Linking this number to Miles shows the incredible weight he will have on his shoulders from the expectations of his family to the expectations of the fans as he becomes the first true Spider-Man of color. Later on, we see Miles visit his uncle Aaron Davis, and if you haven't figured it out by now, this is the prowler we saw infiltrate Oscorp earlier. Spider number 42 crawls out of Aaron's bag and bites Miles, and he blacks out. When Miles comes to, his father and uncle are in the midst of an argument. Miles, not wanting to be in the situation, flees the scene, and we get a look at the first manifestation of his power. 
It's reasonable to think that Miles being anxious about the tension between his uncle and father wanted to just disappear from the situation, and his new powers allowed him to do just that. In fact, we saw this camouflage technique used by Spider number 42 at the beginning of the story. This issue got me and many other fans hooked, as the installation of Miles and the Spider-Man mythos felt so real and organic. This was super refreshing as in the mid to late 2000s, especially after the presidency of Barack Obama, there was a big movement in race swapping iconic characters in pop culture just for the sake of representation. This in itself isn't such a bad thing, but when the reasonings and story behind the race swap are half-baked and poorly executed, for people of color it feels more like receiving someone's sloppy seconds than anything. We would much more prefer having a completely new character created with a fully realized backstory that feels like a backstory someone who looks like us could have. I can't speak to how Miles resonates with someone of Hispanic origin, but as a black kid growing up in the 2000s, Miles was extremely relatable to me. He didn't exactly come from a rough background like most black characters in pop culture, but he also wasn't super privileged. He had just the amount of privilege that doesn't exactly guarantee success in this life, but was certainly enough to make him feel guilty for having a slightly better situation than others in his demographic. I felt this plight firsthand as a kid who people called rich and spoiled just because I went to private school, but those same people had no idea that it was because of my private schooling that I had to go without a lot of everyday luxuries that were common among middle class households in the 2000s. Miles was solidified as the true successor to the mantle even more as future issues saw him struggle both internally and externally with replacing Peter who meant so much to the city of New York. We get to see him ask Peter's loved ones why he put on the mask and observe how the people of the city were affected by the death of Spider-Man. We even get to see people like Nick Fury and Captain America refuse to train him because they felt responsible for Peter dying so young. These issues, titled Ultimate Fallout, were a great way to lay out the gravity of the responsibility for Miles. If it were Peter's responsibility to don the mask because no one else could, it was Miles' responsibility because now that someone had done it, the city can't go without a Spider-Man. While Ultimate Fallout solidified Miles as the new Spider-Man for skeptics, nothing meant more to Miles' future and the entire Spider-Man mythos than what I believe is one of the greatest Spider-Man stories ever told. By 2012, the comic book community was still pretty divided on the fact that Spider-Man was black, even though the main universe, Peter Parker, was still Spider-Man and still going strong. However, Brian Michael Bendis, creator of Miles Morales, would drop a storyline that would put the debate about Miles being Spider-Man to bed for good with the series titled Spider-Man. The series opens up with the main universe Spider-Man doing everyday Spider-Man things, when he stumbles across Mysterio tampering with a strange rift. Spider-Man gets sucked into this rift and finds himself in Earth-1610, the ultimate universe. Peter is understandably very confused as he's never been here before. He goes around seeking answers and that's when he runs into none other than Miles Morales. This moment was huge because for the first time we have Peter Parker Spider-Man standing mask to mask with his ultimate universe successor. This of course is confusing for Peter who thinks Miles must be some sort of clone. And it's confusing for Miles because the Spider-Man in his universe is dead. The two, unable to come to an understanding, begin to square off when Peter tries to unmask Miles. Now this is a good time to go over Miles' abilities in comparison to Peter as it will provide a bit of context for this fight. Earlier I mentioned that Spider number 42 had different characteristics from the spider that bit Peter and this led to Miles having a slightly different power set. Miles of course can stick to walls, produce webbing, has augmented strength, speed and agility and a spider sense just like Peter. But he also has a camouflage ability that allows him to turn invisible as well as an electric shock in which he can supercharge his webs and other things around him. He later calls this his Venom Blast. These alternate abilities allow him to get the upper hand on Spider-Man 616 as Peter thinks he's fighting a clone and is unaware of these powers. Miles accidentally shocks Spider-Man and knocks him out. And when he removes the mask, he sees that it is indeed Peter Parker. For clarity, in the Ultimate Universe, the identity of Spider-Man was revealed to the public when he died. So everyone in the Ultimate Universe knows that Spider-Man was Peter Parker, a high schooler from Queens. This prompts Miles to take Peter to Nick Fury as whatever is going on is clearly beyond his comprehension. Keep in mind, at this time, very few people in the Marvel Universe and even fewer people in the Ultimate Universe are even aware of the multiverse. So 616 Spider-Man showing up on Earth 1610 is extremely perplexing for everyone involved. When Peter comes to, he explains to Nick Fury that he theorizes that he may have slipped into an alternate universe. 
Again, this is just a theory for Peter as even he has never confirmed the existence of a multiverse. After hearing the theory, Nick Fury releases Peter into the care of Miles Morales and tells him to show Peter around the city and explain to him what happened to his 1610 counterpart. Eventually, Spider-Man sees a recent news article that explains his death and how the world knows Peter's secret identity. This is all overwhelming for Peter and what happens next is why Spider-Man is one of the best Spider-Man stories ever told. Peter, struggling to come to terms with what he's heard, shows up on the doorstep of Aunt May and Gwen Stacy for one of the most emotional reunions in Marvel history. Now if most of what you know about Spider-Man comes from the movies, then you're probably unfamiliar with Peter's original backstory. In the Raimi films and the MCU, Peter's main love interest is Mary Jane. This is borrowed from the Ultimate Universe. But in the main line of comics, Peter's first love was Gwen Stacy. Unfortunately, he was unable to save her and she died during an altercation with the Green Goblin. This affected Peter even more than Uncle Ben's death because in a lot of ways he was directly responsible. Knowing this fact amplifies the gravity of the reunion so much because for Peter, he's looking at his first love, alive and well and even younger than when he last saw her. Also seeing his aunt, a familiar loving face in a world so strange. And for Aunt May, she sees her nephew who sacrificed himself for her. Gwen is seeing her best friend who helped her through so many struggles, alive and even older than when she last saw him. This is an opportunity no one gets. For Aunt May and Gwen, it's closure for the Peter they no longer have. And for Peter, it's a chance to see the impact he has on his loved ones and how they'll honor his memory when the day ultimately comes that he dies being Spider-Man. I don't want to spoil too much of this comic as I highly suggest you read the series, but in the end, before Peter goes back to his universe, he gives Miles his blessing and thanks him for continuing the tradition of Spider-Man. And if you know anything about Peter, this is big because he has never been too keen on allowing someone else to be Spider-Man. Hell, it took him 40 years just to be mildly okay with Ben Riley, his literal clone, taking the name Spider-Man. The Spider-Man series not only solidified Miles in his role as Spider-Man and let everyone know that Peter Parker in the Ultimate Universe wasn't coming back, but it also hit on a different level especially for me. This is where I realized how wrong I was about Miles becoming Spider-Man or even Peter dying. The Spider-Man series reminded me of the main reason I love Spider-Man. One of the very few comic book characters, even back then, that, that was covered from head to toe. Like, if Captain America, you still yeah. have this much of his face. Spider-Man's completely enveloped in his costume. Oh, you so know the good thing about that? Yes. You could be any kid. Yeah. You could be black. You could be Asian. You right. could be Indian. You right. could be anything and imagine you were in that costume. Right. So I think that made it relevant. If you're a fan of the MCU, you've probably heard the term Secret Wars being floated around ever since news of No Way Home dropped. That's because Secret Wars is the next big storyline that will complete the multiverse saga in the MCU. In the comics, the 2015 storyline of the same name will mark the end of the Ultimate Universe and the beginning of Miles' time in the big leagues. Secret Wars opens up in the fallout of the multiverse collapsing. Previously, the Avengers had discovered that all the universes in the multiverse were colliding with and destroying each other until just two remained. The two remaining universes, Earth 1610 and Earth 616, the Ultimate Universe and the Main Universe. I'm not going to get into too much detail as the collapse of the multiverse is a huge storyline that spans across six years, but basically the Illuminati were unable to stop the two universes from colliding and in a last ditch effort, Reed Richards created a ship to save what heroes from the main universe he could, and Thanos and some other villains did the same thing. As the universes collided, Miles Morales manages to sneak aboard the villain's ship and survive the end of the multiverse. Doctor Doom, having recently acquired godlike powers, took the remnants of all the universes he could find and merged them into one big planet in which he would become the god of this new world. He called it Battle World. Now the Secret Wars event is too big to go into right now and Miles is barely even in the series, so I'm not going to cover the whole event, but I highly recommend reading it to prepare you for what comes next in the MCU. So I want to pick up where Miles comes in. After Miles emerges from the life raft, he links up with Spider-Man from the main universe, and together they enter what is called the White Hot Room. And in it they find Owen Reese, the Molecule Man, who's holding the world together. Because Molecule Man is basically an all-powerful prisoner here, he's extremely hungry and he asks anyone who visits if they have food. When he asks the Spider-Man, somehow Miles just so happens to have a hamburger in his pocket. Comics, am I right? Even though this is super strange, it pays off in dividends as once the day is saved and the multiverse is being rebuilt, 
Molecule Man repays Miles for his kindness by bringing back everyone Miles lost in his home universe and moving them along with Miles into the main Marvel Universe. That's right, Miles is no longer just an alternate version of Spider-Man that lives in an alternate version of Earth. From now on, he will exist in the main Marvel Universe and fight alongside Peter Parker Spider-Man. He will go on to have his own line of comics, team up with the Avengers, play a major role in the Civil War events, and even become one of the leaders of his own team, the Champions. It eventually even gets to the point where no one calls him Ultimate Spider-Man or Spider-Man Miles Morales anymore. Now he's just called Spider-Man. I cannot tell you how huge this was. To this day, Miles is the only Marvel character to belong to two universes equally. Before Miles, no one who was created for an alternate universe was ever permanently moved into the main line of comics. Miles managed to literally transcend universes and it wouldn't even be the last time he'd do so. When I was writing this, I couldn't figure out whether to cover the Spider-Verse movie first or the Spider-Verse comic book series. But they really do go hand in hand as far as the story of Miles Morales and why he means so much to the Marvel Universe. So I'm going to do my best to cover them at the same time without this video getting too convoluted. Here we go. Alright, let's do this one last time. My name is Peter Parker. I was bitten by a radioactive spider. And for 10 years, I've been the one and only Spider-Man. In 2018, Sony Pictures released Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, drawing loose inspiration from the 2014 comic book event called Spider-Verse. These two stories were monumental in the mythos of Marvel's multiverse and really kicked off the multiverse craze we see today, not only in Marvel, but in all of pop culture. One of the great things about comics is that when stories are retold in film and TV, multiple story arts can be covered in one movie or show just because time works differently across mediums. The MCU mastered this formula as all of their movies pull from about three or four different comic book events. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a combination of All New Spider-Man number 1, Ultimate Spider-Man number 160, Edge of Spider-Verse, and Spider-Verse. So to backtrack a little here, Secret Wars, as I previously talked about, was the culmination of a six-year multiversal saga within Marvel Comics. And it all pretty much started with Miles Morales. Before the Spider-Man comic, there wasn't really a lot of multiverse talk within the Marvel Universe. It wasn't until Peter ended up in the Ultimate Universe that we received actual confirmation that the Ultimate Universe and the main universe could even cross over. But Peter's return to Earth 616 brought certainty to the fact that the universe was indeed a part of a multiverse. So I have to take a little time to explain the multiverse of Marvel, but I promise it'll all come together in the end. As you probably know, the multiverse is an infinite amount of universes where things are always different in some way from the main universe. In Marvel Comics, there is this thing called the Great Web, which is literally a spider web that holds the multiverse together and it's kind of like a gateway to travel between universes, and it's watched over by someone called the Great Weaver. I imagine by now you're starting to see the heavy spider thing connection, that's going to be important later. Anyways, now that you know that, we can talk about the Spider-Verse. So the first act of the film is pretty much just a retelling of all new Spider-Man, but I love the flow in which everything is delivered. We get to see Miles starting his new school, his personality amongst his peers, his relationship with his parents and his uncle and his spider bite all within the first 20 minutes of the film. The best part about this movie is Miles' personality here versus in the comics. In the comics, Miles is basically a carbon copy of Peter for the first couple of years, but in the film, he's vastly different. He's popular amongst his old school's crowd, he's a stand-up guy but also harbors an artistic rebellion and a passion to do things his own way. I especially love the fact that in the movie he's an artist, where in the comics he's just kinda smart, but not as smart as Peter. And then also not as smart as Genki, since that has to be Genki's thing, I guess? Anyways, having him be an artist adds to the idea of Miles being a new, innovative version of Spider-Man. It also plays into his relationship with his uncle. In the comics, Miles loves his uncle and they hang out and stuff, but the more time we get with Aaron, you start to find out that he's kind of a jerk. And even though he loves Miles, ultimately he put himself first and actually manipulates Miles to his own benefit. But in the film, he's Miles' mentor as an artist, which makes the reveal of him being the Prowler so much more heartbreaking. One of the major differences here though is, in the film, Aaron dies because he won't harm his nephew. In the comics, the Prowler dies when his suit malfunctions and explodes while he's fighting against Miles. 
It is a bit ironic when you consider this because while Into the Spider-Verse looks to separate Miles from Peter, having his uncle die in this way is more in line with classic Spider-Man as him having ability and not acting costs him the life of a loved one. Whereas in the comics, Miles believes he is the one who killed his uncle. To him, it was having abilities and acting irresponsibly with them that cost him the life of a loved one. The first act of the film, I felt, was a great way to introduce fans to the character of Miles and kept a lot of stuff from the comics that made fans initially fall in love with him while improving on other aspects. Now when we get to the death of Peter Parker and the multiverse stuff, this is where Into the Spider-Verse really starts to carve out its own story. So the original Spider-Verse comic is basically a story where a group of spider people from across the multiverse have to team up to stop a family of spider-eating vampires from killing all the spider people across the multiverse. Oh, and this team is led by Superior Spider-Man, which is Doc Ock's mind inside of Peter Parker's body. And if this all sounds insane, it's because, <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. They don't call it the Multiverse of Madness for nothing. So really, the only thing the movie borrows from the comic is the fact that a group of spider people team up. I honestly didn't think introducing a Spider-Verse movie into the mainstream audience would even work, but the writers managed to do it perfectly. Having Kingpin, a well-known and recognizable character, be the one to initiate the colliding of the multiverse is extremely clever and this is why I think this story was able to go over so well with even the most casual of Spider-Man stands. There's really nothing I can say about this movie that hasn't already been said. The animation was groundbreaking and paved the way for other creative endeavors like Arcane and Intergalactic. The story was relatable and had a good message. The soundtrack was a certified banger. This movie was just all around good, and as much as I disliked Miles when he first came to be, I am so happy that this film did well because it brought a character that many people had just vaguely heard of and propelled him into the pop culture spotlight. So here's where we talk about that secret superpower I mentioned earlier. For comic book fans, it's not much of a secret, however if you look up Miles' power set, I don't think this would be labeled as a power of his. Remember that great web that holds the multiverse together? Turns out spider people have a huge connection to the multiverse. I won't bog you down with the specifics, but essentially and also theoretically, all spider people have access to the multiverse because of their connection to the great web, which would make all spider persons, including Miles, multiversal travelers. And what happens when you essentially have unlimited access to the multiverse? You become transcendent. The most important thing about Miles was never the fact that he was a person of color or a new version of Spider-Man, although those things definitely helped. The most important thing about Miles is that he did what no one had done before. He transcended universes. By leaving the Ultimate Universe and making the main universe his home, he transcended comic book storylines. Then he transcended universes again by landing in the animated space. Hell, I'm willing to bet that more kids know Miles Morales as the Spider-Man from the Spider-Verse movie rather than Miles Morales from the comic. He transcend once more by landing in Sony's Spider-Man PS4 and then later his own game. And with the release of Across the Spider-Verse right around the corner at the time of writing this, I think it's possible that his biggest universe jump may be on the horizon. Remember, Miles got moved into the main Marvel Universe at the end of Secret Wars. The same Secret Wars that will be the end of the multiverse saga in the MCU. What if, after the collapse of the multiverse, the day is saved and everything is put back together, we see a young Miles Morales, the same Miles Morales from the Spider-Verse films, appear in the MCU in live action? I know, I know, I sound like a madman right now, but considering how the Across the Spider-Verse trailer literally made reference to the events of Spider-Man No Way Home, and we know for a fact from What If that animated universes can collide with the MCU, I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility. But Steven, you say, there's already a Miles Morales in the MCU. Donald Glover was Aaron Davis and he mentioned his nephew. True, but check this out. There was already a Miles Morales on Earth 616 in the comics too. After the events of Spider-Man, Peter was curious on whether Earth 616 had a Miles Morales. Turns out there was one and he ended up being evil and becoming a huge villain for Miles. I think it will bring the idea of Miles full circle to see him move from the Ultimate Universe to the main universe to animation and video games into live action because the idea of Spider-Man is far more transcendent than any other hero. It's like Stanley said, you could be anyone of any identity and imagine yourself under the mask. You don't have to be a white kid from Queens or even a superhero to understand that with great power comes great responsibility or even just any ability comes with a moral demand that we use it for good and the betterment of society. 
The creation of Miles Morales paved the way for the idea that everyone already subconsciously knew. Anyone can wear the mask. You could wear the mask. If you didn't know that before, I hope you do now. It's because we got a physical interpretation of a black Spider-Man that we were able to get other cool interpretations like Spider-Gwen or Penny Parker or even Spider-Man India. It's because of Miles Morales that we got the Spider-Verse and it's because of the Spider-Verse that we got Secret Wars and No Way Home and even other multiverse related media. Miles was the proof that we could imagine our heroes differently or even imagine them in other properties. Like come on, we literally got John McClane in Call of Duty and Aaron Yeager in Fortnite. And I know DC had the multiverse first, but that really only connected with the comic book fans. Miles and Into the Spider-Verse brought it into the mainstream. And whether you love or hate the multiverse craze, one thing you have to admit is that it opens up some new pockets of creativity and allows for cool and interesting stories to be told. It reaffirms the idea that anything is possible. So go ahead creators, throw your craziest ideas at the walls and see if it sticks. The possibilities of what new and interesting perspectives we can view the world through are endless. And it's all because Spider-Man is black. What's up humans, it's Steven. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and consider subscribing. Or you can just check out this video that YouTube thinks you'll like. Remember to drink some water, and if no one's told you today, just know that I love you. Peace out everybody.